on Richard E. Grant. Hello. Hello again. Hi. Hello again. Um, I'm going to be starting the conversation with a few questions, but if you have any of your own, please join in at some point. Um, the obvious question is, how did you get involved in this movie? It seems very different for both of you. Who, who, who got on board first? I'm not sure. I mean, he, he, uh, Richard Shepard, the writer, wrote you the part, wrote the part for you. Yeah. Did he, he call you first? He, he got my Skype address from my agent, and, uh, and he Skyped me out of the blue, and he said, I've written this part especially for you, and I thought, yeah, yeah, it's bullshit. And he was an American, and I thought, well, you know, the chances are it'll never happen. Because either somebody much more famous will get the part, or it'll never get made. And uh, he then told me that, no, he was definitely going to do this, and would I stay on board if I liked the script? And then a couple of months later, or five months later, he said, oh, Jude Law is playing Dom Hemingway, and Jeremy Thomas is going to produce it. Would you still want to do it? And I went for half a nanosecond, said, yes, of course, I do it. So here I am. Boom. That's how it happened. Uh -huh. Jude, did you take a lot of convincing to take this part? Uh, no, not a lot, but uh, there were certain reservations. Um, I think more than anything, it was my... Uh, there, there was a fear factor, just because it, I knew that it would be quite a lot to take on, and there was a, a, a fear of, uh, I suppose, failing, because it was... Um, uh, going somewhere, I hadn't. Well, going somewhere that sounds a bit excessive. It was it was stretching mm -hmm. a new muscle, put it <laughs> that way. Yeah. And um, and then I met Richard Shepherd, and I knew that having he, he'd written this wonderful part in 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 this very exciting film script, but he also came over as a man who really cared and really believed in the possibilities of the part and the film and. He seemed like a very nice man as well, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and that's important. Now, we got a flavour of the character from the trailer. Who is Dom Hemingway, and where is he when we, we meet him at the beginning of this movie? Uh, Dom's in prison when, you, when the film starts, coming to the end of a 12-year uh, prison sentence. Who is Dom Hemingway? Dom is, well, it depends, you know, I mean, uh, Dom, Dom sees himself as this legendary gangster, this, this uh, iconic kind of rock and roll star uh, on the streets of East London, South East London. Um, in reality, he is a kind of shambolic and petty criminal who sort of scrapes by and comes out of prison really to realise that the world has moved on, the world's really forgotten about him, even if it, whether it knew who he was in the first place, we don't know. But he is fueled with a really magnificent uh, embrace of the English language and all its profanities. He has a, a, a delicious sort of contradiction of violence and humour, of um, uh, oh, sentiment yeah. and... What, is, that, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Swears and like it's a... those contradictions that, that I think make him really interesting. So are you about to say? No, no, I just... Just laughing because you've you've you put the, his use of language so politely. <laughs> <laughs> swears like fifteen five thousand sailors in one mouthful. He takes swearing. Actually, the swearing's an interesting part of this film because Richard Shepard, the writer director, is an American, uh, as we've mentioned before, and he had only been to the UK, I think, three or four times prior to writing this. But he's a very very good writer, and he's written. It's like his ode to uh, uh, his. Uh, um, favourite uh, uh, British films and, 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 and he's created, in my mind anyway, a character who sort of really fits in alongside the Falstaffs and the, uh, and the uh, uh, Ebenezer Scrooges and the, or, or no, the, the Bill Sykes yeah. and I mean he's a kind of iconic sort of British lover of the, uh, uh, the gutter and uses, you know, um, swearing as a way of punctuating, uh, but almost like poetry. And, and the, he was very specific about how, I remember there's that one line I had to you where I, I, I used the word, am I allowed to swear? Go on. He used the word <laughs> yes. fuck yeah. in about four <laughs> different ways, but he yeah. was very particular, wasn't he, about whether yeah, it was, you fucking fucked up fucker, or whether it was, <laughs> you fucker, you fucking fuck. I Fuck mean, you. And it was very, very specific, yeah. wasn't it? And there's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> now, Richard, who do you, you play a, uh, a character called Dickie. Who is Dickie and what relation does he have to Dom? 
Dicky Black has no backstory that you ever find out about in the film, except that his, <laughs> you see his wife, who looks like a miserable old goat, in a photograph on a wall in a shitty house. Um, <laughs> and all he explained to me was that basically he's a, probably from a very good family and is a black sheep of that family. He's ended up with somebody from the opposite end of the social strata. And they meet in the middle and you know, weld this friendship together. So it's a meeting of opposites. So whether it's I'm the sand to the pearl in his oyster or the other way around, I don't know. But they sort of rub along and, and that, that, that's how it works out. Well, there's something the film does tap into. It's like a very British, it's like a staple of British comedy, which is the couple that can't live with each, live with each other and can't live without each other. Yeah. It's a very symbiotic relationship. When I knew, when I knew that, obviously, one of my first questions was who's, who's, who's playing Dickie? And, and uh, Richard told me that, that Mr. Grant was going to play Dickie. And it said so much about the relationship <laughs> already, you know, that there was, that, that had Dom been, had Dickie been another Dom, it wouldn't have been as interesting, and their yeah. mismatch is, it, and and the, the the fact that there's obviously an oddity in their friendship, w which we never really re reference, no. uh, makes them all the more uh, matched in a funny way. And it's like a classic double act, and that you've got the straight fall guy, mm. um, who I play, and then you've got the ranting nutcase, who I'm trying to sort of rein in all the time. But it's. I think like all my experience of great friendships, and I don't know whether this is particularly British or not, but if someone had to hear Bruce Robinson and I, who wrote and directed with Nell and I 100 years ago, having a conversation, they, they might think we hated each other because the level of abuse and invective would be so bad, mm. but you can only really insult people that you really know well and that you really love. Uh, so I think that's not dissimilar to the relationship these two guys have in this. They say the most terrible things to each other, and at the end you know they're still going to carry on being in business together. Uh -huh. You mentioned with Nail and I. Was that something that Richard mentioned when he offered you the part in the first place? He didn't at that time, but he told me subsequently when he was very drunk one night that when he was a 22-year-old destitute writer in L.A., he had uh, had a cookie jar full of dimes, and he used the last bit of that money to go and rent a video copy from Sunset um, Tower Records, which was then on Sunset before it went defunct, to rent a copy of Withnail and watched it endlessly because he had no money and no food. And that kept him going. And then he didn't return it and then owed $250 fine. And they said, you stupid fucker, you could have bought the film <laughs> for the, the amount of money that you spent on this. But he d only told me that afterwards. And I said, why didn't you tell me this at the time? I'd been very flattered and believed you more. He said, no, it would have been too arse licky. I said, you could have <laughs> licked my ass with pleasure. <laughs> now, as well as the personality mismatch, they look very different. Can you talk about the looks of each character, starting with Dom? How did you, that's a very different look for you, and how did you settle on those characteristics to close? Um, a lot of the work I did with Richard, the, the, the writer-director, um, not this Richard, in, in, in preparation and build up was um, to he'd written a wonderful part but as a Londoner I wanted to make sure that that part was grounded and rooted in, in, a, in a very firm reality and so a lot of the work started with, with, with really nailing down exactly where he grew up in London um, and what his childhood was like, how he had met Dickie, how he had met his, uh, his, his ex-wife um, and all that had happened up to the, me the beginning of the film and part of that was also to think about, well, how would this life he's lived, and, and, and for an audience to believe in the life he'd lived, have affected the way he looked. And we sort of came up with a, a diet and a, you know, the history of various fights, which was left scars or broken noses or what have you. And um, at the bottom line was, this was a man who, who didn't take care of himself, had drunk far too much, eaten appalling food smoke 40 fags a day and so that became my diet for about three months lots of whiskey fags <laughs> hamburgers ice cream um more ice cream and uh, how much how much weight did you gain i don't know i never really weighed myself and i watched the film the other day and it didn't look like i gained an awful lot but it just adds a sort of sagginess and a certain bloated quality of the cheeks and uh yeah, I didn't feel well at the end of the five months, I'll be honest. We got to, we got to the very end. We were talking before about g dragging oneself over a line. Yeah. I remember feeling that by the end, I was, I was so nauseous of, 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 of you know, um, 
smoking and drink. It was I was I was ready to to quit. Yeah. Did you have a dietary regime on this movie? <laughs> Uh, to stay pencil slim at all times. <laughs> no, the character, the look that they went for was Julian Day is a brilliant costume designer and Richard Shepard, the writer-director, uh, fixed on these Hunter S. Thompson uh, tinted glasses with sort of teardrop 70s shape. And they said, that's what you have to wear. Um, those glasses, the mullet hairdo, which I provided, and very elegant retro 70s clothes, as though I had been sort of time-warped and stuck. Pickled pickled in time, that, that my greatest moment in my life had been in the mid-70s and had just stuck there as <laughs> sort of the equivalent of Ivana Trump's look for a man, that you don't move on in time, you just are <laughs> fixed in a sort of past your sell-by date look. And so I think that combination of being fish out of water in that look and then Jude's character being stuck in prison for a dozen years meant mm. that he was out of sync with what people were wearing. So both of us are trying to sort of catch on to what's going on and never sort of fail upwardly throughout the story. Well, Jude, can you comment on your wardrobe in this movie? Yeah. Uh, it looks very tight. <laughs> it was Everything very is tight. super tight. It was very tight. When he was clothed. The, uh, <laughs> the, well, again, Jude, a great costume designer, helping an actor kind of express himself all these layers added to, to you know, the essence of the man, and Dom has this enormous opinion of himself. So wearing this kind of electric blue shark, shark skin suit and winkle picker high heel boots and um, rings, and, uh, and yet cut in a way that you realise he's owned this suit. He probably was a, a, about a stone lighter when he last wore the suit before he went into prison. So we had this wonderful tailor come and fit the suit, and the first time we had the fitting, it, it was like it was like a glove. And Julian and I were like, "No, you got to you got to take it in by like two inches all over." And the, and this poor tailor was appalled, saying, "No, no, no, but it would look awful." And we're like, "Yeah, that's right. We want it. You know, it's got to it's got to be skin tight here and skin tight here and under there and." Anyway, we kept forcing this poor guy to cut more and more off and cut it in and in and in. And um, it helped me, uh, uh, yeah, assume the shape of someone who was sort of squeezing out of it like a bag of uh, toothpaste. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> we're going to go to audience questions now, if anybody has a question. Um, we, we have a roving microphone, uh, and it's coming from this direction. Um, question to uh, Mr. Grant. Uh, Please call me Richard. Richard. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> What's uh, surprised you most about Jude's uh, approach to Zom as a character? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that because, obviously, you know, I, I had followed his career in the theatre and in movies from when he was 19 years old, first saw him at the, in a play at the National Theatre. And if you work with somebody, or you, you know of somebody with a public persona of the amount of genetic handsomeness and beauty that he is naturally born with, that is very annoying <laughs> for the plainer people of the planet of which I count myself. So at some point I thought, how serious would he be to work with where he's playing somebody that on paper has let himself go, his guts hanging out, he has to take all his clothes off in one scene. And then when I met Jude and he'd already put on about 25 pounds and then grew the Wolverine thing, sideburns, and then put a a sort of nose piece in this nostril every day to make the, the nostril sort of stick out like this. You know that he was denying it and absolutely <laughs> doing it for real and positive, you know, properly. Um, so my admiration went from sort of pretty high to off the scale, which sounds like it's a bromance, and it was. <laughs> yeah. I now worship him. <laughs> so thank you for your question, which has humiliated me utterly. <laughs> um, another question? Oh, over here. It's that, that other thing, just, just oh. if I can just add, that if you're... I had met Jude socially a couple of times, but when you're working with somebody and you've got to be best friends with them in a story and you've got to convey that in a very short space of time I in a movie shoot, um, you hope, and obviously the producer and the director are seeing whether you have chemistry with that person or not, so you really hope that it's, that will come across on screen. So mercifully, it's paid off and it has. I think it has. It has. Yeah. And it was interesting. We didn't I mean it was wonderfully written, I keep saying that, but it we and we did get on. We yeah. got on and, and we'd gotten on in the past, but we 
like you said, we were sort of thrust together and had to get on. Yeah. But what became apparent was we also didn't need to discuss an awful lot. Yeah. We, 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 we met and we kind of got it and we just did it and proceeded to have a lot of fun off camera too. Um, but that's a good sign. I think if you're sitting there, you know, analysing and dissecting uh, a relationship, on, then you're maybe overlooking it, you know what I mean? Or, or overanalyzing it. Um, question over here. Yes, I, I had a question from Mr. Lau Jude. Hello. <laughs> um, hi. Sorry, I had a question because uh, your last um, movie, it was Anna Karenina, and then suddenly you go t into a very comedy movie. So, um, I don't know, is it uh, you just want to switch from um, romantic to comedy or and then to Broadway because you got Hamlet in November. So uh, you want to just switch or you want to go yeah. into routine? What do you um, plan to? Yeah, so I, I like, I, I kind of enjoy the uh, uh, challenge and um, the opportunity of, of, of changing up the 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 uh, the challenges of 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 the parts I play. I also I don't know. I mean, I really I lo I really love acting, but it's 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 pretty it's hard work and sometimes can be quite boring. Um, you know, genuinely making films, <laughs> making films can be quite boring. So the idea of turning up playing the same part over and over and over again to me really sounds like turning it into something terribly monotonous. And in, it shouldn't be. It should be something wonderful every time you go to work and you're embarking on something new. So I quite like the, uh, if I can find it, the opportunity of, of trying different things. Um. Well, uh, Brando said that we're all actors. Do you think that we all act in the real lives? I do, yeah. I do. I think we all perform in different, in different ways, in different situations. There's a forlorn hand over there. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> I think that's where the next question is coming from. Oh, here you go. Hi, uh, Hi. My question is to both of you, and it is, who is your favourite literary character that you've always wanted to play, your dream role? on stage or in a film? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> um, should we come back to that one, what you've thought about it? Or? Sure. Who do you suggest? Personally or yeah. for you? For us. You're not an actor, are you? No. Okay, well then we don't care. <laughs> no, I'm sure you're lovely. You don't need to play other parts. <laughs> um, Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights. For you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm maybe a bit old for Heathcliff now. I tell you a book I love is 100 Years of Solitude. And there are lots of different characters in that. But I don't know whether we'd, you'd need a master, you'd need a, you'd need a Coppola kind of scale director to pull off a book like that. Um, and I'd play any of those parts. Right. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Uh, uh, slightly uh, inconvenient, but she's got a question. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Shout it out. He's coming, he's coming around. Oh, he's coming. It makes it more exciting. Um, it's another favorite question. Um, what was your favorite part for both of you throughout making this film? Something that stood out, something that you really will remember from this film? You go first. Okay, um, we have lots of arguments in pubs, uh, either, <laughs> either in collusion against the rest of the world, which, which is always funny, or we verbally bitch slap each other, in which I go, fuck you, and fuck you, fuck you, that goes on. Um, and I really enjoyed that, because you feel like you are ping-ponging, like in real friendship. And we were just sitting in a bar with the drinks and, and doing that, so yeah, the challenge was not to laugh in between. So I enjoyed that. I enjoyed insulting Jude Law enormously. <laughs> <laughs> there was a great, there's a, there's a huge party sequence in the south of France when I, uh, Dom, Dom and Dickie, Dom's finally got out and Dom and Dickie go to the south of France for his reward and the film peaks very quickly before it all sort of slips into the shit and uh, there's this huge party and we shot it over a, a period of a couple of days and it just, 
There was no real liquor uh, drunk, I promise you, but it was just, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I look back on that with great fondness. Um, we were genuinely just, it was coming up with stupid ideas. What can we do next? Um, and that will always uh, be a, a, a great memory to me. I also really enjoyed what the first time we worked together was on the train. Mm -hmm. And with a film like this, um, when you're, you've not got a big budget, um, you've got to come up with uh, new and brilliant ways of, of cutting corners and what have you. And someone worked out that rather than have a set or, well, rather the best way to shoot on a train on the way to France is to take hire out a carriage and genuinely shoot it on the route that you're actually taking. So we had this one carriage. He and I would sit there. All the people that were doing our hair makeup became the people on the train and we just shot this scene. Yeah. And it was, it felt incredibly um, guerrilla and you know, uh, uh, well, didn't it? On, yeah. uh, uh, on the hoof, and we kind of we grabbed what, ne what we needed, and then there we were in the south of France, ready to carry on the film. It's such a strange three-part process because when you're on your own and you read the script for the first time, you go, "God, I, I, you can imagine what it's going to be like, and who's going to be in it, and what a great experience it might be." Then you make it, and that's a whole other experience, and you hope that that's good, and that went so well. So these two bits now have gone that well together, and then you think, fuck, how's this going to translate into an audience? So we're at the Toronto Film Festival which had its world premiere last month, and you were waiting, and then you hear the laughter coming, and you think, they're experiencing what we experienced making it, that you go back to my experience mm. of first reading it on your own. So all three boxes have essentially been ticked. And at the end of it, as the credits have gone down, because all, all the audience are there, it's packed, um, start asking, questions like we're doing here, except you unfortunately haven't seen the movie yet. Um, this one guy stood up and he said, uh, what's going to happen? Is it going to be a sequel? And Richard Shepard, without a beat, just said, yeah, Dom and Dicky do Vegas. <laughs> it was like an incredible response. And we thought, that, that's, nobody's tweeted yet about it. It hasn't been media fed or saturated with information about the film. That's somebody just watching it saying, I want more of this not to end now. So, you know, hopefully from here to their ears. So we may be back for 17 sequels. <laughs> I'm afraid that's I'll be all like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you, thank Jude you. and Richard. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you.